A very good morning to one and all present here. My name is Prajwal Mishra and I'm currently working under the supervision of Dr. Damodar Reddy in MPC division. I welcome all of you to the fifth Nobel Symposium organized by CSIR CDRI. On behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to welcome Dr. Radha Rangarajan Ma'am, Director CSIR CDRI. Therefore, we would like to give a bouquet of flowers to Ma'am. Along with them, along with her, to our mentors, just as a token of appreciation who, has gu who have guided us throughout this, to Dr. Suman Habib, ma'am. <laughs> to Dr. Ravinder Kumar, sir. And finally, to Dr. Kinshuk Rajshavastav, sir. Thank you so much. As it is globally known, since 1901, Nobel Prize have been presented to the laureates on 10th of December in various fields such as science, literature, and peace. In the year 2018, Professor Tapas K. Kundu, former director CSIR CDRI, initiated this Nobel Symposium series, dedicated to the Nobel laureates for their achievements, which has provided greatest benefit to mankind, and to get inspired by their work. And to get inspired by their work. So here we are. Let's begin the event by quoting that science is the way of thinking much more than it is the body of knowledge, and scientific achievements are worthless unless they are proved beneficial to the society. Let me give you a quick index of our program. It is divided into two sessions, and today we have five speakers overall, which will be taking us together to witness the journey of all the four Nobel laureates. The best part of this event is that it is fully managed and organized by the students of CDRI and has a very smooth history till today. So in the first session, there will be three speakers who will be covering the work of Nobel laureates of chemistry, and in the next session, there will be two speakers who will be taking care of the domain physiology or medicine. In the year 2022, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been given to Dr. Carl Barry Sharpless, Professor Morton Peter Meldal, and Professor Caroline Rudbertozzi, who have been given Nobel Prize in, the, in Chemistry for the development of click chemistry and its bioorthogonalization. Along with them, in the field of physiology or medicine, Professor Swante Pabo, a Swedish geneticist, received Nobel Prize for his research in the field of genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. So let us start our first session. It is Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2022, which is all about finding new chemical tools and letting simplicity and functionality take precedence. Click chemistry is something which fulfills the demands of this objective. It is the modern approach of synthesizing drug-like molecules and materials which can accelerate the drug discovery process by, using, by utilizing uh, sustainable, practical, and reliable chemical reactions. The click term itself refers to the easily joining molecular building blocks as the two pieces of seed belt buckle. Let's have a short audio-visual introductory clip about click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. Nobel Prize in Chemistry on October 5th for their work on click chemistry and bioorthogonal reactions. Click chemistry means linking chemicals together, while bioorthogonal reactions take click chemistry to living cells which might be helpful in cancer treatment, diagnostics and delivery of drugs. Sharpless was awarded the Nobel Prize for the first time in 2001 for his work on chirally catalyzed oxidation reactions. He introduced click chemistry to make reactions between molecules fuss-free. But it must occur in the presence of oxygen and water, which is cheap and environmentally friendly. Subsequently, Meldal demonstrated a chemical reaction that found applications in pharmaceuticals and other materials. 
Meldon's and Sharpless's labs showed that adding copper to azide and alkyne <coughs> speeds up the reaction. It gave rise to a product called triazole, which is useful in pharmaceuticals, dyes, and agricultural chemicals, according to the Nobel Committee. Since copper is toxic to living beings, Bertozzi proposed bioorthogonal reactions, which allow click chemistry within living cells without needing a metal by twisting the shape of alkyne, allowing it to become more reactive. Bioorthogonal reactions helped Bertozzi map complex sugar structures lining cells called glycans. Glycans protect tumors from the body's immune system, and Bertozzi developed a type of biological pharmaceutical to block glycans' protective function. This potential anti cancer drug is now being tested in clinical trials on people with advanced cancer. Professor Sharpless found the concept of coined the concept of click chemistry for which he received Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2022. To, de to describe his work in detail, I would like to invite Ms. Sangpriya Singh on stage. She is currently working under the supervision of Dr. Ajay Kumar Srivastav as UGC SRF in MPC division. Thank you everyone. Uh, sorry, thank you Prajal and good morning everyone. Today I am going to present the work done by Nobel laureate Professor Carl Very Sharpless. His passion for chemistry was preceded by a passion for fishing. Professor Sharpless was born in April 28, in 1941 in Philadelphia, USA. He graduated from the French Central School in 1959. He continued his studies at Dartmouth College. Professor Sharpless originally planned to attend the medical school, but his research professor convinced him to continue his studies in chemistry. He earned his PhD in organic chemistry from Stanford University in 1968, and he continues his postdoctoral work at Stanford University with Professor Coleman. Professor Sharpless uh, is the research professor. Uh, professor Sharpless is the professor of chemistry at the Skip Research Institute in California. He is passionate about finding new useful method for the chemistry. His imagination and vision lead him to discover a series of reactions for oxidative addition or selective, uh, or selective additions. Uh, his imagination and vision lead him to discover a series of reactions for selective oxidation, and his achievement have won him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2001. Professor Sharpless current research focus on click chemistry and how click chemistry has found its uses in biomedicine. And again, in the year 2022, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, along with Professor Meldal and Professor Bertozzi. The most complex chemical structures were not made by chem chemists. They were made by nature. Enzymes are the nature's catalyst that work at the atomic scale. These are some examples uh, which synthesize by nature itself. Nat na natural products usually have diverse and complex architectures and are furnished with versatile pharmacological activities, uh, such as quinine used as anti-malarial drug and humorithrin used for anti-cancer. And there are many more offering an abundant source for the therapeutic drug discovery. Researchers were inspired by an effect observed in nature they spent months or years trying to synthesize the same compound which is synthesized by nature effortlessly. For researcher to synthesize a complex molecule is not so easy. It takes multiple steps and each of which needed to be optimized which generate waste and byproduct. It is time taking, costly and energy consuming. Purification at each step makes the process tedious and disposal of toxic waste material during every step can cause environmental concern. So after taking all these points in consideration, Professor Sharpless wondered, is there any sustainable way to address these challenges? And then he coined the concept, including a class of chemical reactions, and termed it as click chemistry. By the use of click chemistry, instead of synthesizing the complete natural molecule, we can synthesize 
targeted molecules um, by inspiring by the nature simply joining the small modular units together with the heteroatom links such as carbon nitrogen bond and carbon oxygen bond as we can see here this is a quinine triazole containing natural product derivative for the better properties like less toxicity and no adverse effect the goal is to develop an expanding set of powerful selective modular blocks that works reliably on both small and large scale application by the use of click chemistry now let me explain what is click chemistry it is neither a concept nor a discovery it is a collection of reactions feasible for every chemist in the world in click chemistry we can use a small molecular carbon frame and link it together by using bases of heteroatoms so we can understand this beautiful and simple concept by just looking at this picture it is as simple as the buckles and ligos are clicked together to form the varieties of product which can be utilized for the biomedical applications since he coined the term click chemistry in 2001 he set the criteria for click type of reactions with his colleagues those chemical reactions having such uh, features Uh, as like atom economy water compatibility versatility and selectivity are known as click type of reactions along with that it should be capable of occurring in the presence of oxygen and water as we all know water is a universal solvent water and oxygen both are easily available and environmental friendly so this is a green chemistry approach with huge potential this is a uh, there, these are the following classes of chemical transformation having the features of click type of reaction the first one is cycloaddition reaction in which unsaturated species like alkene or alkyne react with azide to form this substituted triazole by a 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction but also the dial sider family of uh, transformation where alkene and alkyne react with diene to form this cyclic product by a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction secondly nucleophilic ring opening reactions of the uh, strained heterocycles such as epoxides and as uh, aziridines addition reaction is, is the another type of addition uh, click reactions where the nucleophile added to the carbon carbon multiple bond such as michael addition and thiol in addition as well as thiol ion addition the oxidation reactions of alkene is the another type of click reaction such as epoxidation and aziridination condensation is the type of click reaction where oxygen is replaced by nitrogen to form the hydrazone and oxymes as at the time when the sharpless analyzed the reactions types he uh, he got most attracted towards the beauty of 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction where a terminal alkyne react with azide to form this substituted triazole which is also a part of many fda approved drug like tazovectam mivirtinib carboxyamide triazole and teso this reaction was the paradigm shift for the click chemistry and it is also known as hisins 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction or 1 3 dipolar cycloaddition reaction This is the history behind the discovery of click chemistry and the historical background of cycloaddition reaction. The azide functionality because of its reactivity and stability has played a central role in the development of cycloaddition reaction. In 1893, a Michael used the phenyl azide in the reaction with the alkyne dimethyl butane diiode to form this substituted triazole. Further, in 1950, Kurt Elder and co-workers I noticed the reaction between phenyl azide and norborenin derivatives to form this triazole containing multicyclic product by the end of 1950 to 1961 rolf hisen carried out a series of reactions between phenyl azide and strained alkene and he came to the conclusion that the reactions were concerted cycloaddition reactions in 1963 professor hisen modify his previous reaction by using alkyne instead of alkene with the azide to form the substituted triazole product in the zero selective manner the 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction of alkyne as an azide to give the 1 2 3 triazole as a product 
is simply follow concerted mechanism and easy heterocyclic synthesis. Once he is said that the dream of reactions proceeding quantitatively under mild reactions condition without the need of catalyst is often fulfilled by concerted cycloaddition reaction. But every good thing takes bad thing behind it. The drawback of this reaction is that this reaction take place at high temperature because of the high activation energy due to which it takes lots of time from hours to days with poor reserve selectivity. To overcome these previous limitations, in 2002, Professor Sharpless introduced the copper as a catalyst in the alkyne azide cycloaddition reaction. And it became the best example of click chemistry in the history of cycloaddition reaction. And it is also known as click reaction. Copper catalyst decreases the uh, activation energy barrier due to which this reaction takes place at room temperature and it keeps the region specific product with high yield. At the same time, Professor Melder in the Carlsberg laboratory in Denmark tried the reaction with peptides, which we'll discuss later in detail by my co-presenter. Uh, Professor Sharpless introduced the mechanism of copper catalyzed reaction, where this copper catalyst coordinate with the alkyne and organic azide to form this six-membered copper three metal cycle. In the final step, this ring contracts to form the cuprous triazolide, which further undergoes the protolysis to release the triazole as a product. But in 2013, Hawking et al. reproposed the mechanism of copper catalyzed reaction, where the dinuclear copper species is used as an intermediate. According to the kinetic studies and DFT calculation, the carbon and nitrogen bond formation here is easy because of the absence of copper and carbene back bonding, due to which the triazole formation is faster by a path B as compared to path A. According to the DFT calculation, this path is more appropriate and more acceptable in current scenario. Further, in 2004, Professor Sharpless introduced the click concept in polymer chemistry. And uh, this is not surprising that the click chemistry is one of the area of synthesis in which function is always far more important than the structure. Professor Sharpless and others have also used the click reaction to put the polymer together to form the complex structures. Professor Sharpless used the polyacetylene core with the azide containing dendron to form this free-like molecule called dead dimer, which have its uses, uh, which have its uses ranging from catalysis and addition to drug delivery. A unique property of these triazole containing dendron is that as the DNA molecule reaches to its complexity, it becomes less soluble in non-polar solvent and surprisingly more soluble in aqueous mixture. Water solubility is good for biological application and this reaction is highly regioselective and to give one for dye substituted triazoles. Uh, further, in 2005, Professor Sharpless introduced the uh, click chemistry in biomedical science. Professor Sharpless' aim is to create a highly reactive sticky spot with the right target group. Professor Sharpless and co-workers use the click reaction to form the uh, molecule uh, in C2 with the enzyme of uh, acetylcholine esterase enzyme. They use click reaction to assemble the molecules with the use of small building blocks containing acetylene and azide. The um, uh, idea is that the active site act as a mold to create the molecule which can uh, bind to the active site. As I have mentioned earlier, that copper catalyzed reaction gives only reason, one reason isomer, one four di substituted triazole. At that time, Professor Sharpless curiosity was not ended with the copper. He also stabilized the ruthenium catalyzed click reaction, where he got another reason isomer, one five di substituted triazole. After some trials, when he used ruthenium acetate complex, he get 1,4 di substituted triazole as a product, whereas when he used pentamethyl cyclopenta dienyl ruthenium complex, he get 1,5 di substituted triazole as a product. 
further he gives the mechanism of ruthenium catalyzed reaction where ruthenium catalyst coordinate with the alkyne and azide to form this ruthenium cycle intermediate via oxidative coupling in step B which further undergoes the reductive elimination to release the triazole and regeneration of uh, ruthenium catalyst. According to the DFT calculation, this uh, mechanism is acceptable and the step C is the rate determining step. Moving forward towards the contribution of click chemistry in drug discovery, in the left side, these are the number of papers published between 2001 to 2020 that contain a key, uh, that contain a keyword click chemistry or triazole according to the Scopus citation database. On the right side, this is the graphical presentation of diseased area in which click uh, concept is utilized to form the bioactive molecules. Click chemistry has increasing application in all aspects of drug discovery uh, in biomedicine, such as polymer chemistry, uh, bioconjugate DNA probes, fluorescent molecules, drug, drug discovery, and drug, drug delivery. Uh, click chemistry provides the powerful, attractive alternative to conventional chemistry. This is the Indian scenario on click chemistry. There are many scientists who are working on the fundamental research based on click chemistry. Some of the CDRI scientists who are working on the utilization of click chemistry for the biomedical research and application. Click chemistry is not limited to lab. This is the translation of click chemistry from lab to industrial level. Companies such as in vitro and aleron enzymes stabilize especially for the click based research in, collabor in collaboration with Script Research Institute in La Jolla, California. Base Click is a Germany based company who linking the as a variety of, of azide with the nucleic acid. Professor Sharpless opens the door to pharmaceutical development, polymer chemistry, and material science via click chemistry. He is the fifth person who was awarded with the two Nobel Prize, and he is the second person to receive the Nobel Prize in chemistry twice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sangpriya, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Ms. Sangpriya, for this wonderful presentation and letting us know how Professor Sharpless coined the concept of click chemistry where molecular building blocks snap together easily and efficiently. Along with him, Professor Mildal was also working, though independently, in the development of click chemistry, which he explored on biomolecules such as peptides and sugars. To discuss his work in detail, I would like to invite Mr. Jhajan Lal on a stage. He is currently working as CSIR SRF under the supervision of Dr. Damodar Reddy in MPC division. Thank you, Prajul. Good morning, everyone. As you have seen, my colleague Sankuriya already explained advantage of click chemistry and its application on a small molecule as a drug candidate. Now I will explain exploration of click chemistry on biomolecules. This work is carried out by Professor Morten Mendel. Professor Morten Mendel born in Denmark. He has joined Technical University of Denmark as a research scholar. After that, he has completed postdoc from Cambridge University. At the present, he is a professor at University of Copenhagen, Denmark. His research area including click chemistry, automation in synthesis, enzymatic and cellular assay, biomolecular recognition, organic synthesis, and polymer synthesis. We know that the serendipity is an unplanned fortunate discovery. One serendipity incident also took place in Professor Mendel's life, which changed the direction of his research. In the earlier of this century, he was developing a method for finding potential pharmaceutical substance to block the pathogens. One day, he and his colleagues conduct a pure routine reaction to that their aim was to this alkyne and acyl halide react in presence of base and find this desired molecule. In other reaction vessel, he took the same substrate 
alkyne and acyl halide molecules in presence of base and add catalytic amount of copper iodide. Reaction go smoothly when Professor Mendel is analyzed what happening in the reaction vessel. He found something new, not a previous product. This alkyne and this azide create a ring shape that is and create a ring shape and form this triazole. In 2002, parallelly, Professor Sarplus also published a concept of click chemistry between alkyne and azide. Now I will start journey of Professor Mendel life from getting serendipity to receiving Nobel Prize in 2022. Professor Mendel first time applied click chemistry concept of on solid phase synthesis. Here they used uh, here, here they used peptide containing uh, molecule on solid phase by in presence of base, copper iodide, and azide, and form this one four substituted triazole. So, so all the reaction conditions are compatibly on solid phase synthesis. So he synthes he synthesized tetrapeptides on alkyne containing with sequence glycine, phenylalanine, glycine, phenylalanine. This alkyne react in presence of base, copper iodide and different substituted azide. Different substituted, he got different types of product like sugar containing triazole, heterocyclic containing triazole and triazole between two peptides. All peptides give show the most obtained more than 60 percent yield. Professor Mendel also tried to internal alkyne region bonded peptides reaction but this reaction did not work. Another Professor Mendel explored the triazole nucleus for the peptide foldamers. Replacement of unstable one with triazole nucleus maintain the biological activity, it can be improve drug ability of peptides. Chemical modifications such as secondary structure mimic increase the structure rigidity and potentially, potentially stick the conformation in bioactive conformations. A linking functional group on peptides provide convenient and efficient way to increase the di diversity and bioactivity. Attachment of synthetic molecule to a biomolecules, biomolecules like a peptides, proteins, sugar, used for the various therapeutics and uh, imaging application. In peptide chemistry, turn play an important role for the in, turn play an important role for the secondary structure of peptide along with alpha helix and beta stand. Most of the protein folding required reversal in the direction of polypeptide chain. This protein is stabilized by many factors like hydrogen bonding, pi pi interaction, etc. A triazole incorporated molecule had bring this interaction and so the beta turn. Here Professor Mendel developed a recognition molecule. Recognition molecule, these molecules are bind to these proteins and first they have developed using this scaffold, first they design in silico beta body in silico beta body in presence of many proteins and he synthesized on solid phase different types of molecules and these molecules are showing best binding affinity as compared to without triazole containing molecule. The other application of this Professor Samuel is working in Columbia University. His, his laboratory is pursuing the development of clinically used carbohydrate based drug discovery. Here the Professor Mendel developed a new technology conjugation of glycopeptide and polypeptide via click reaction. The role of glycopeptides carrier protein conjugation. This technology could well prove for the development of clinically used, clinically used drug candidates. Another application of click reaction is carbohydrate and nucleic acid conjugation. Carbohydrates play a central role in metabolism, cell-cell interactions, pathogenic dispense, defense. Despite this, carbohydrate based drug discovery is still infancy. The carbohydrate makes poor lead molecules and low metabolic, low metabolic susceptibility and difficult to synthesize. In the click chemistry has a click chemistry used to promising the acylate this interaction and incorporation of this triazole nucleus has increased the weak carbohydrate receptor interaction through the multivalency. Professor Sarplus also explored the click chemistry for the nucleic acid conjugation. Here they used glucosamine diphosphate containing alkyne and, and in azide having a R group aliphatic as well as the aromatic. Using this condition, he synthesized 86 derivative of triazole containing molecules. These derivatives are showing the fucosyl transferase inhibitor activity. Out of them, diphenyl containing molecules are showing the best activity. Melanocartin receptor, this, so an, another application of click reaction is melanocartin receptor. 
melanocotin receptor are involved with diverse number of physiological function including pigmentation exocrine secretion inflammation on this we have melanocotin receptors are classified into this category these are this is third melanotized is the fda approved drug used for the genetic obesity and melanotan second was under development as a drug candidate used for the female sexual dysfunction but it was withdraw from clinical phase due to some side effects set melanotides and melanotan second are cyclic peptides in these molecules four residue are common and used as a pharmacophore this pharmacophore itself is not active but after doing some modification on c terminal and terminal it shows some activity so professor mendel took the inspiration from these molecules and did some modification and finally they had done cyclize via click reaction he synthesized 17 cyclic peptides were synthesized and screened for the conformational preference ligand receptor interactions out of 17 peptides peptide 1 are selectively binds and so the agonist activity in this figure peptide 1 selectively bind mcr4 receptor and it show the best agonist activity with mcr4 receptor mcr4 receptor targets for therapeutics and metabolic dysfunction another application of this uh, hdac inhibitor is a new class of anti cancer agent and used for the anti and that the play that play an important role for the epigenetic and non epigenetic regulation this is the episidine is a naturally occurring cyclic peptide used for hdac inhibitor here in this molecule this is the pharmacophore that bind to zinc and amino acid residue in this molecule they had modified the proline by a triazole nucleus using click chemistry this triazole containing molecules showing the best ic similar ic50 value as compared to naturally occurring peptide epicidine this is the another class of hdac inhibitor here berino state is the FD, first hd approved drug in hd approved drug used for the here they modified cap component with saha with different substituted aryl substituted heterocyclic nucleus the heterocyclic compound heterocyclic containing molecules are showing the best ic50 value as compared to saha in this linear this is the linear peptides containing a 12 amino acid these six amino acid residue are responsible for the activity so professor harrison et al used this six amino acid as a pharmacophore for the next generation of peptide so here they modified proline gamma position by click chemistry and after further modification has done by connecting these two exposed moiety via a flexible linker and compare its activity from parent peptide the ic50 got improved from micromolar to nanomolar after cyclization again ic50 got improved three fold more than this linear peptide professor professor mendel also work on protein post translation modification and active enzyme synthesis this is the tap protease used for the this is the tap protease cleave sequence of peptide between glycine glycine serine and glutamine generally expression of full length protein from bacteria is difficult due to self destructive often they kill the host cell so professor mendel thought how we can resolve this problem professor mendel has envisioned one strategy that is called split click protein chemistry here first they split this enzyme into two half protease and express each half protease in separate e coli bacteria using this non canonical amino acid they found both inactive protease after that both inactive protease coupled via click reaction and form triazole containing active enzyme protease this enzyme show the beta hairpin structures and these both protease cleave the sequence in this in this peptide via glycine and rate of hydrolysis both protease almost similar so triazole nucleus is present as a core structure in era of drug category such as anti diabetes anti hypertensive antibiotics the broad and potent activity of triazole nucleus a nucleus having broad and nucleus having a broad tendency to mimic the stabilize the molecule triazole nucleus having a tendency to mimic disulfide bridge linkage in cyclic peptide it is a bioassociator of trans amide bond and carboxylic acid in peptidiomimetics mimicking the beta strand geometry and triazole nucleus triazole linkage relax the conformation of constraint so in current scenario some some few of scientists in india also working in during covid 19 duration our cdri scientist dr atul goel dr damodar reddy dr ashish arora dr nithi kumar used click chemistry for the development of development of covid 
for the development of for the development of rt pcr kit so here they use fam containing azide and uh, quencher containing alkyne coupled by a click reaction and form this triazole professor kana and sureshan berking nice turvendram he developed a new technology topochemical azide azide topochemical azide alkyne cyclo addition reactions topochemical azide alkyne cyclo addition reaction so this reaction is this reaction having a tendency to monomer crystallize and this this reaction also work only for the bioactive molecules professor sunita and ratan is also working amid amethi university she is working only novel material for the hydrogen peroxide vapor sensor she use starting material alkyne functionalized nanographic plate and azide functionalized styrene by using this copper iodide and form this nano composite containing molecules this is the group of the professor mendels thank you thank you so much mr jhajan for presenting the work of professor mendel we generally highlight over his contribution towards the development of click chemistry and its utilization over biomolecules this area has expanded its swing to several other fields such as therapeutics diagnostics therapeutics diagnostics and many other our cdri is also not lagging behind in utilizing the concept of click chemistry as has been mentioned by the presenters in their slides the above two novel laureates that is professor sharpless and professor meldel was working in the development and the advancement of click chemistry and professor bertozzi initiated its utilization into bio orthogonal chemistry the term given by her itself bio orthogonal chemistry refers to a class of chemical reactions which can occur inside the living system without interfering the native biochemical processes to describe her work in detail and give a broader idea i would like to invite miss priyanka pande on stage she is currently working under the supervision of dr atul goel as inspire srf in mpc division thank you prajwal for the introduction good morning everyone today i have got this opportunity to enlighten some of the work done by professor bertozzi i would like to start this presentation by quoting her chemists are dreamer we think of new molecules and bring them to life professor bertozzi was born on 10th october 1966 in united states and completed her phd in chemistry from the university of california Her research area is mainly focused on therapeutic opportunities in glycosynthesis which is the study of complex carbohydrate on the surface of lipids and proteins. Professor Bertozzi received Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2022 for the development of bio orthogonal reactions uh, which is now being used to improve targeting of many pharmaceuticals. Let's first understand what is bio orthogonal reaction. It is a chemical reaction involving reactant a and b to form c occurring inside the living system without interfering its native biochemical processes the term bio orthogonal chemistry was coined by professor bertozzi in 2003 it is a sub class of click chemistry used for biological system this is a pictorial representation of taking reaction from lab to living system through a set of bio orthogonal reactions bio orthogonal chemistry does allow organic synthesis performed in a lab to be performed in a living system for theranostic purposes when we talk about conventional organic synthesis there are some fundamental criteria we have to keep in our mind such as choice of solvent reaction temperature and by product monitoring all these conditions can be optimized but when we are willing to do a reaction in bio orthogonal manner all the criteria is are now changed and particularly focused on high selectivity fast kinetics biological ph and temperature sensitivity overall we can say that reaction environment for bio orthogonal reaction is more demanding than a conventional organic chemistry now the question is why it is so difficult to perform a selective reaction inside a living system and the answer is 
वाटर सेंसिटिविटी ऑफ रिएजेंट एंड अटैक ऑफ न्यूक्लियोफाइल सच एज अमीन्स थायोल्स प्रेजेंट इन साइड द सेल रिड्यूसिंग एनवायरमेंट इन द साइट ऑफ सोल रिएजेंट्स दैट रिक्वायर हीट एंड हाई कंसनट्रेशन आर ऑल्सो अन एक्सेप्टेबल इन साइड द सेल प्रेजेंस ऑफ सेलुलर डाइजेस्टिव एंजाइम कैन ब्रेक योर रिएजेंट एंड द अटमोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट लिमिटिंग फैक्टर इज रिएजेंट टॉक्सिसिटी सच एज यूज ऑफ टॉक्सिक मेटल्स इफ बायो ऑर्थोगोनल रिएक्शंस आर सो डिफिकल्ट टू परफॉर्म वट इज द नीड ऑफ ट्रांसलेटिंग रिएक्शन फ्रॉम राउंड बॉटम फ्लास्क टू लिविंग सिस्टम ऑल दो we have come so far in the field of science and technology still we have so much to learn regarding the molecular interactions and chemical transformations that enable life and bio orthogonal reactions have allowed us to explore numerous biological processes that were previously difficult to study using techniques such as fluorescence based imaging along with this bio orthogonal chemistry has its prominent application in drug discovery advanced biomaterial synthesis as well as in cell surface engineering organic tools to study biological processes in detail are the foundation to modern science and this chemistry is providing us the opportunity for the early diagnosis of disease and development of innovative medicines over the 20 years since its inception bio orthogonal chemistry has become a key methodology for biological study which i will be discussing in next few slides and the and the nobel prize for the development of bio orthogonal reaction itself shows its major contribution in drug discovery a rapid survey of literature clearly indicates that a drastic increase in the number of publication in past two decades where bio orthogonal chemistry is mainly utilized for imaging and pharmaceutical purposes bio orthogonal chemical reporter strategy provide a mean to tag bio molecule starting with the incorporation of this chemical reporter into bio molecule followed by attaching the probe into the bio molecule via bio orthogonal reaction utilizing the concept of clique chemistry here chemical reporter refers to a small abiotic molecule such as uh, carbonyls and azide and this entity having a binding site for this chemical reporter and a flow tag for its detection both the components needs to be inert to surrounding biological environment and the reaction must be fast even at low concentration initially ketones and aldehydes were used as a bio orthogonal chemical reporter but there are some limitations in first generation chemical reporter they they give endogenous keto metabolite interference and they they give irreversible they give reversible reaction while second generation chemical reporters are azide azide is a popular functionality in organic synthesis and the azide possess unique chemical properties that have been heavily employed in organic synthesis such as it is abiotic biologically inert soft and a 13 dipole dipole it also overcomes the existing limitation of first generation chemical reporters azide is now used as a bio orthogonal chemical reporter to probe many biomolecules in a living system and azide containing drugs are also been clinically approved using azide the first reaction developed was todinger reaction it occurs between a phosphine and an azide to form this azaelide which in the presence of water uh, undergo hydrolysis and spontaneously pr produce this primary amine in hyld both the reactants are abiotic and essentially unreactive towards the biomolecule thus these reagent met many of the criteria required for chemoselective ligation but the problem with this reaction is this azaelide is not stable in water and produces this toxic phosphine oxide as a byproduct so professor bertozzi modified this reaction by the introduction of with rearrangement of this unstable azaelide to form this stable amide bond further professor bertozzi used this reaction for cell surface engineering in in vitro and in vivo 
cells. The two-step process involves in cell surface engineering are feeding of precursor containing a desired bioorthogonal chemical reporter to the cell up, upon biosynthesis inside the cell it get expressed at the, at, uh, the cell surface and then we can perform bioorthogonal reactions. Most of the work done by Professor Bertozzi is mainly focused on this sialic acid. Let's first underline the importance of sialic acid. Our cells are coated with sugar. When we think of sugar, we probably think of white crystalline table sugar that we use to make coffee or cookie. But sialic acid is not the kind of sugar that we eat. These are different sugar commonly pre present in all cell surfaces which are connected together to create a powerful structure called glycans. The, these sugars that are populating the surface of your cell have a lots of information is in stored in them. Such as these pattern of glycans can serve as an indicator of disease like cancer. To know how sugar coating on your cell leads to cause cancer or treat cancer, let me take you to the journey of sialoglycan which led to the Nobel Prize in 2022. Sialic acid is a monosaccharide, a healthy cell has a certain pattern of sialic acid. But in cancerous cell, there is an overproduction of sialic acid in the form of tropical rainforest. Few decades ago, correlation began to emerge from the analysis of tumor tissue to look for changes. And it was discovered that the sugar had increased the density of this sialic acid. Now the question is, why do cancer cells have more sialic acid? It has something to do with our immune system. In 2010, we came to understand that how important is our immune system is in protecting us from cancer. Immune cell engage through receptors present on the um, pre present on their surface to the ligand present on the cancer cell or damaged cell. When this activating receptor cluster with high enough density, they deliver this information that kills the target. But there is a family of protein that grabs this sialic acid which results in uh, inhibition of activating signal and deliver the false information that cancer cells are also fine just like healthy cell. So maybe the reason here this cancer cell have an overproduction of sialic acid is because it allows them to confuse immune cell and survive. Professor Bertozzi is now developing new methods to rapidly and robustly monitor and target sialoglycans which are a potential target for cancer therapy. Here to map glycan, here bioorthogonal chemistry is used for cell surface engineering in Zerkut and Hela cell and was selected as a metabolic precursor. Zerkar cell were incubated with this synthetic sugar and in and upon biosynthesis acids installed within the cell surface. Uh, after that, isolated splenocyte were reacted with this biotinylated phosphine using bioorthogonal reaction to form this stable cell surface adduct. After staining with fluorocene isothiocyanate, the cells were analyzed by flow cytometry and they showed a marked increase in fluorescence in intensity, indicating that the, these biotin moieties are accommodated on the cell surface. This is a representation of Staudinger ligation can be executed in living system within their native environment. And for that, Professor Bertozzi used this synthetic sugar and injected uh, uh, laboratory mice were injected with this synthetic sugar and inside the cell this sugar got metabolized and appear on the cell surface. In the next step mice were injected with this phosphoflag and in the body of animal this phosphine would find the azide to undergo bioorthogonal reaction to form this product. We can monitor this product by using fluorescence tagged monoclonal antibody. They showed an increased signal 
for fluorescence intensity indicating that the Staudinger ligation had proceeded in vivo. That's how they turned mouse into a reaction flask. Despite of its all amazing qualities, Staudinger ligation is a rather slow reaction at biological temperature. It is a bimolecular reaction and for that rate is equal to intrinsic rate constant and the concentration of two reacting partner. And in a biological system, the concentration of these two reacting partners are quite low. So the rate of reaction of this reaction is very important. And for Staudinger ligation, it is about 10 to the power minus 3 per mole per second. It took hours to proceed, sometime days. So, the slow rate of Staudinger ligation limits its biological application. Then, what else an azide can do? Azides have an alternative mode of bioorthogonal reactivity that is 3 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction with alkynes. They, at that time, this chemistry was well established by Professor Sharpless and Professor Meldal independently and their work is already pre already been described by the previous presenter like azide alkynes are also quite rare in biological system we don't have them in our body but the reaction of azide and alkyne at room temperature is also very slow reaction so professor sharpless and professor melder uh, demonstrated the use of copper catalyst to increase the rate of reaction but the application of copper catalyzed click chemistry is also challenging for biological system because of the cytotoxicity of this copper so professor bertozzi started thinking that there could be another mechanism to increase the rate of this reaction without using any toxic metal catalyst back in the year 1961 professor wittig another nobel laureate in chemistry demonstrated the use of cyclo Cyclic reacting partner for this azide. The reaction uh, uh, cyclic alkynes are stained because of this compromised bond angle. This reaction proceeded with an explosion, result uh, giving the corresponding triazole product and releasing almost 18 kilocalorie per mole energy which was ultimately utilized for increasing the rate of reaction. So Professor Bertozzi employed this reaction for selective chemical modification of living cell, the copper free click chemistry. And, and she modified her previous approach by replacing the phosphine label with this cyclooctane probe. And this probe was utilized for cell surface tracking of glycans. Researchers spent several years in building a cyclooctane probe with different modification to increase the rate of reaction. reaction and later on other groups also reported that the tetrazine could also be used as bioorthogonal reagent with a great kinetic window. Now this bioorthogonal toolkit continues to grow. As I have explained earlier, the role of sialic acid as a shield for cancer cell. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. This is a typical model of synapse between T cell and cancer cell. Cancer cells have a dynamic balance between the two type of response. This middle one is activating receptor. They work by activation of immune cell. This PD-1 and CTLA-4 are inhibitory receptor. They inhibit the activation of immune cell. There could be different strategies to target cancer cell. One of them is blocking the interaction between this receptor and ligand by the use of monoclonal antibody to quench the inhibitory response but because of poor penetrability and drug resistance now potentiating this now blocking this pathway is not potentiating the immune response so other strategies can be blocking of these siglec protein receptor present on immune system and prevent them from binding to sialic acid but there is one this is a family or uh, this is a quite large family of 14 members 
and most of the siglets are often expressed in combina combination. So developing drug for each member of this family will not be practical. So Professor Bertozzi advocated another strategy. Instead of targeting these receptors, one could target this sialic acid by stripping the sugar coating of cancer. Uh, she may, uh, her idea was to develop antibody enzyme conjugate, uh, antibody enzyme conjugate. The, uh, the selected marketed drug was trastuzumab. It used against HER2 positive cells only and she made its conjugate with sialidase enzyme which catalyzed the hydrolysis of sialic acid from the cell surface. To make a proof of concept molecule, they have made a bispecific biological can candidate and a part. In first step, they functionalized this monoclonal antibody with azide and in Second step, they functionalized this sialic acid with this cyclooctane probe. This azide, this azide undergo copper-free click chemistry to form this product TCA. They have engineered this molecule in hope that it will selectively remove sialic acid from cancer cells only. To test the selectivity of this reagent, they mixed together the HER2 positive and HER2 negative cell in a tube. Then TCA was added and it selectively bind to HER2 positive cells and, and uh, hydrolyze sialic acid from HER2 positive cells only. We can monitor its efficacy by just looking at this data that uh, even quite low doses of TCA, it is effectively strips sialic acid from HER2 positive cells only, leaving HER2 negative cells alone. This was a very nice uh, therapeutic window. So, Professor Bertozzi joined forces with an oncologist, Professor Hens, for further studies. We can see from this graph that TCA is uh, effective in breast cancer model that is resistant to this marketed drug and TCA is able to reduce the tumor, uh, tumor volume very effectively. Then Professor Bertozzi translated this work in human therapeutics by starting a company named Paleon Pharmaceuticals. Paleon scientists did optimization of this antibody enzyme conjugate and, make, and made its conjugate with human sialidase enzyme. The lead first molecule is in first human dose study. 20 years ago, Professor Bertozzi started this reaction as a, a basic research for lab. But over 10 years, there, there has been a considerable translation of this reaction from lab to industrial level. Currently, there are so many biotechnology companies that, were, that are working on bio-orthogonal chemistry in various fields such as for making antibody drug enzyme conjugate, for making vaccine conjugate. Some of them are in phase 2 clinical trial. Professor Bertozzi is the co-founder of Lycia Therapeutics and advisor to Sash which is now performing the bio-orthogonal reaction in the body of cancer patient. Professor Bertozzi is the founder of bio-orthogonal reaction, a reaction that is compatible with living system. This simply, the simplicity of this reaction has made it tremendously popular from lab to industrial level. In her Nobel lecture on Nobel Prize Day, Professor Bertozzi said that this whole work is purely based on the shoulders of curiosity-driven basic chemistry done by Professor Staudinger, Professor Heisen, and Professor Wittig a hundred years ago to develop new pharmaceuticals, to develop diagnostic strategy. You must have the foundation established by basic science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Priyanka, for giving such a wonderful and excellent presentation and letting us know how Professor Bertozzi initiated the utilization of click chemistry into bio-orthogonal chemistry, which is now being used in exploring of cells 
tracking biological processes and improving the targeting of cancer pharmaceuticals. Overall, it can be said that click chemistry and bio-orthogonal chemistry together have taken the simple chemistry into the era of functionalism, bringing the greatest benefit to mankind. Now we'll have a short break of 15 minutes after which we'll start our second and the final session, which will be moderated by Mr. Shashi. So we'll be meeting here after 15 minutes.
हेलो हेलो हेलो
वेलकम बैक एवरी वन आई एम शशिधर स्टूडेंट ऑफ डॉक्टर राजेश कुमार झा एंडोक्राइनोलॉजी डिविजन सी डी आर आई इन दिस सेशन वी सेलिब्रेट साइंस वी रिजॉइस यूनिक कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन ऑफ एक्सेप्शनल इंडिविजुअल्स हुज डिस्कवरीज टू कोट एल्फ्रेड नोबल हैव कन्फर्ड द ग्रेटेस्ट बेनिफिट टू ह्यूमन काइंड द डिस्कवरीज वी सेलिब्रेट इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू आर स्टेलर एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ सच ब्रेक थ्रूज within the field of biology and physiology or medicine our ultimate goal is to achieve scientific breakthrough breakthrough that significantly deepen our understanding of health and diseases but this year i take pleasure of mentioning an add on that is deepening our understanding of human origins as well professor savanto pabo won his nobel prize i quote for his discoveries concerning the genome of extinct hominins and human evolution Professor Pabo was born on 20th April 1955 Stockholm Sweden following his high school graduation he served one year at military service Sweden he then joined Uppsala University in 1981 finished his phd in 1986 his doctoral research was based on investigation of how e19 of adenoviruses modulates the immune system He became deeply interested in human evolution and Egyptology, which led him to pursue postdoctoral research at Institute for Molecular Biology II, University of Zurich, Switzerland, and postdoctoral research at Department of Biochemistry, University of California, USA. He was quite enthusiastic and dedicated to his in his work field of research, that is human evolution. and made many discoveries in his field of research the outcomes of his research were recognized worldwide and got him prestigious awards and to name a few leibniz prize in 1992 genetic prize for medicine in 2005 great cross of merit with star in 2009 kio medical science prize in 2016 darwin wallace medal in 2019 japan prize in 2020 and finally nobel prize for physiology or medicine in 2022 He is a professor of general biology at University of Munich. Currently, he is the founding director of Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology, Germany. In this session, we will celebrate Professor Pabo's work by two presentations. First, I would like to call upon Garvita, student of Vidyut Purket. The title of her presentation is "Paleogenomics: Science of Once Upon a Time." she is going to introduce us to the world of paleogenomics that treasures the untold stories about human migration and evolution from a dna perspective garvita the stage is all yours Hello everyone. So let's take a quick journey like no other. Not to a place, but to a time. And we'll be diving into the human past and exploring our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleogenomics. My name is Garvita Mishra, student of Dr. Vidyut Purke, and I consider this as an honor to be acquainting you all a little more with Dr. Swante Pebo and his work. So we all know that Dr. Chante Pebo has been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discoveries, and I quote, concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. For those who don't know, the term hominin refers to the early human species which are now extinct. And Dr. Pebo's work is significant in many respects. Firstly, because he has pioneered the field of paleogenomics. He has also seen the genome of the neanderthals which are now extinct and found out that the gene transfer has occurred from these now extinct hominins to homo sapiens about 70 to 80000 years ago following the migrations out of africa he has also made the sensational discovery of denisovans which was a previously unknown hominin and his discoveries provide the basis for exploring what makes us uniquely human we'll take a quick glimpse into each one of this 
beginning with the most exciting one, that he has pioneered the field of paleogenomics. So like every scientific re breakthrough research came out of a spark of strong interest. Similarly, at the age of 13, Dr. Pebo's mother took him on a vacation trip to Egypt, where he got fascinated with the pyramids and the ancient things. Dr. Pebo pursued his childhood interest and studied the ancient DNA later in his life and showed us how it could be a useful tool in the study of human evolution, thus pioneering the field of paleogenomics, which consequently paved his way to win the Nobel. Coming on to the precise definition of paleogenomics. So paleogenomics is a field of science which is based on the reconstruction and analysis of genomes of extinct organisms and species. But uh, Dr. Swante Pebo has transformed the study of human origins by extracting the DNA from Egyptian mummies and ancient bones. He went on to sequence the genome of a species that went extinct thousands of years ago, which is a landmark discovery in itself, and thus established the field of paleogenomics, which refers to the study of ancient DNA. But investigating this ancient DNA is not as easy as it sounds because the DNA starts decaying the moment the organism dies and is subjected to various post-mortem DNA degradation processes, which cause the chemical and the enzymatic modification of the DNA. Also, the exogenous contaminations come from the environment as well as the lab. From the environment in the form of DNA from the microbes and fungi that colonize the decaying tissue, and the climatic conditions over the millions of years do degrade the ancient DNA. Additionally, there's a tremendous risk of contamination coming from the in the form of lab handling, equipments, reagents, etc. And guess what? Numerous paleogenetic research papers were later found to be incorrect because of these accidental contaminations in the ancient DNA samples. Dr. Pebo, along with a group of researchers, have worked very hard to develop and refine the techniques to overcome these contaminations and my colleague Trebeni will discuss this in detail regarding how they have actually overcome this challenge. After overcoming this major challenge, Dr. Pebo quickly moved on to another, which was to sequence the genome of the Neanderthals. And I'm quite sure you all must be wondering who are the Neanderthals. So Neanderthals are our closest extinct relatives who died out about 40,000 years ago. And this name is based on the location where the first major specimens were found. So there's this Neander Valley in Germany, and once upon a time, the Neanderthal cave was situated in a limestone gorge called the Klein Fellhofer Grot. But during the 19th century, this cave was completely destroyed due to the industrial scale limestone quarrying operation, and the location of this cave was soon forgotten. What now remains is a Neanderthal theme park with its own museum. This is the entrance to the park and these concrete cross marks represent where the cave used to be. And these poles represent the findings made. This is the original set of bones forming a partial skeleton which was recovered from this cave back in 1856 and was named as Neanderthal 1. And these are the reconstructions showing how the Neanderthals might have actually looked like. Now there's another very important site associated with the Neanderthals, which is situated close to this Neander Valley in Croatia called the Vindia Cave. So in 2008, Dr. Pebo, along with a group of researchers undertook a very ambitious project called the Neanderthal Genome Project, under which these three bones were recovered from this cave and served as the primary source for first draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome. And this forms the major breakthrough part of Dr. Pebo's paleogenomic research. Later in 2017, a high coverage Neanderthal genome has also been published from this cave. So the DNA extracted from these bones was then compared with five present day human genomes, namely San from South Africa, Yoruba from West Africa, Papa from uh, New Guinea, Han Chinese, and French, to analyze the transfer of genes from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens. And quite interestingly, Dr. Pebo has found out that the gene transfer had actually occurred from these now extinct hominins, that is the Neanderthal to Homo sapiens, about 70 to 80,000 years ago, following the migrations out of Africa. So now let us talk about this. 
The story of human evolution began millions of years ago. This is scale shows time in millions of years. And Dr. Pebble's research shows that the Homo sapiens have shared the Mother Earth with other forms of early human species, such as the Neanderthals. And that during their period of coexistence, they have interbred, which is why we have the Neanderthal imprints in the present day human genomes. Questions such as who are we and where do we come from have always intrigued the humanity. To explain this, there's a widely accepted theory. But before moving ahead, let us see the small video regarding how the migrations out of Africa would have happened. So there is this widely accepted theory which states that the Homo sapiens have evolved in Africa and then moved out populating the rest of the world, which is popularly known as out of Africa theory of migration. For migrating out of Africa, they have taken two routes. One is the southern route through the Red Sea crossing the Arabian Peninsula to the Indian subcontinent and the other is the northern route through the Nile River heading to the Middle East and forward. Now here is the twist. Meanwhile, the Neanderthals were, were already present in the Europe and the Middle East. And when the Homo sapiens arrived out of Africa and encountered them, they had coexisted and interbred to a limited degree. Thanks to Dr. Pebo's discoveries, it is now believed that it is this interbreeding which has resulted in the Neanderthal admixtures in the populations residing in Europe, Asia, and Australia, but not in those originating from Africa suggesting that the interbreeding had occurred following the migrations out of Africa. Now the Indian scenario of migrations is particularly fascinating. So the Homo sapiens originating in Africa and then migrating into India date back to about 75,000 years ago from Afghanistan, Swan Basin being the oldest site in this region. Then the migrations from India to Sri Lanka have happened about 60,000 years ago. And many years later, which is more recently, the migrations have happened back into India from Burma, which is Myanmar, about 11,000 to 4,500 years before present. These are some of the pre-Neolithic Stone Age sites shown over here, the Bhimbetka, Adamgarh, Patni, etc. And according to researchers, nearly half of the Indian population has Neanderthal imprints in their DNA, which brings us to another question, and that is how the transfer of genes from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens might have actually happened. So we know that the chimpanzees and modern humans have diverged from a common ancestor about 96.5 million years ago, while the modern humans and Neanderthals have coexisted for some period of time about 54 to 40,000 years ago, during which they have interbred. Dr. Pebo's work shows interbreeding between the Neanderthals and the modern humans. 
And after subsequent generations of interbreeding, we today have a small amount of genetic material from these now extinct relatives, which affects us to this present day. And until this DNA evidence from Dr. Pebo's work was added to the picture, the scientists had actually struggled to understand the theories of past migrations. Moving on, Dr. Pebo has also made the discovery of Denisovans. And I'm quite sure you must be again wondering, now who are the Denisovans? So there's this wonderful cave located in the Altai Mountains of Siberia. And once upon a time, this cave was inhabited by a hermit named Denis. So this cave was named after him as Denisova Cave. Since it is situated in the Altai Mountains of Siberia, the average annual temperature of this cave remains zero degrees Celsius, which has enormously helped in the preservation of the archaic DNA. 22 stratas have been identified in this cave, and luckily the archaeologists have discovered an exceptionally well-preserved small finger bone of a female hominin. In 2008, when Dr. Pebo's team sequenced the DNA from this finger bone, it turned out to be unique. That is, it, is di it was different from both the Neanderthals as well as the modern humans. And this is how a previously unknown hominin was discovered, and they were named as Denisovans. The detailed analysis of this finger bone revealed that it came from a 13-year-old girl who had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. And she was affectionately named as Denny, who was the first generation hybrid progeny. And upon this surprising discovery, Dr. Pebo has remarked, the one place we are sure all three human forms have lived at one time or another is here in Denisova cave. That is, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, as well as their hybrids. And this landmark discovery was also published in Nature. So the precise way the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans are related is still under study. However, the research so far concludes that the Denisovans are the evolutionary cousins of the Neanderthals, and that the Denisovan population at some point of time has overlapped with the Neanderthal population, and that they have interbred, which is why we have Denny and that the Denisovan population too has contributed genetically to the present day human genome. Now summarizing this up, his discoveries provide the basis for exploring what makes us uniquely human. As to why the Homo sapiens have flourished, while the other forms of early human species went extinct. Dr. Swantip Pebo took his brainchild forward, that is the study of ancient DNA, and not only pioneered the field of paleogenomics, but also perfected it by developing and refining the techniques to overcome the contamination, which was a major challenge, and provided us with a solid foundation for further explorations in this area. He undertook the Neanderthal Genome Project and sequenced the genome of a species that went extinct thousands of years ago, which is a landmark and incredible discovery in itself, and also compared it with five present-day human genomes to analyze the transfer of genes from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens and identified that the transfer of genes had actually occurred from these archaic humans to us. He also made the sensational discovery of Denisovans, sequenced their complete genome as well, and concluded that they too have contributed genetically to the present day human genome. So his remarkable research and attempts to understand the hominin interactions between the archaic humans and the modern humans has significantly improved our understanding of human evolution. And his breakthrough research has tremendously contributed to the technological advancement in the extraction and analysis of ancient DNA. At last, I would like to conclude by saying that paleogenomics is a very exciting field of science. Because with old bones, we may never know what the scientists may discover serendipitously, which might allow us to come closer to the full story of our ancestry. Because many questions are still waiting to be answered. Thank you so much for your patient hearing and bearing with me. Thank you, Garvita, for introducing us to the Professor Fabo's work. Now we know that paleogenomics, so beautifully curated by Dr. Pabo, reveals the fine threads of DNA that stitched the cloaks of not only us, but our ancient ancestors too. That brings us to the next talk by Tribeni, student of Dr. Saman Habib. The title of her presentation is Neanderthals, the Unsung Artisans of Human Civilization. 
and she's going to take us through the challenges of Professor Pabu and his team faced in their endeavors to resurrect the lost genomes. Now I'll let her do the talking. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. So uh, today we have all assembled here to celebrate the achievements of Dr. Swanti Pabo in the field of paleogenomics, a branch that he has so beautifully crafted. Now my colleague Garvita has already talked about Dr. Pabo's journey and inspiration in science in paleogenomics. I, on the other hand, am going to take you through the details of the challenges that he had faced in this course and also how he traced Neanderthal contribution in the genetic makeup of modern day human that somehow shaped who we are today. That's why I've called the presentation Neanderthals, the unsung artisans of human civilization. Now, when I asked about his work, Pabo had said that in the 50,000 years that followed, a time almost four to eight times shorter than the total length of period that the Neanderthals occupied on this earth, we, the replacement crowd, have not only managed to settle on almost every habitable speck of land on earth, but instead we have also advanced in science and technology that have allowed us to go to the moon and beyond. And that is what particularly intrigued him about the ancient DNA. He wanted to find out what were the genetic elements that we carried or left behind from our ancestors that helped us be the homo sapiens sapiens that we are today and build this colossal civilization that we are so extremely proud of. And the first step towards that was decoding the Neanderthal sequence. Now, the Neanderthals were a group of ancient hominins whose particular morphology gained prominence in Europe about 450,000 years ago. And under the effect of positive selection and genetic drift, they reached their final form about 150,000 years before present and finally got extinct around 40,000 years ago. The Neanderthals are the closest sister group of modern day humans and Comparing their genomics with ours can actually give us an idea about the type of positive selections that might have occurred. Now, in the course of my presentation, I'll be taking terms like ancestral alleles and derived alleles. Let us find out what they are. We know that we shared considerable ancestry with the chips. So any uh, allele that we share with the chimps are known as the ancestral alleles, while the ones that we do not are termed as the derived alleles. Now, with the zest to decode ancient DNA in his heart, Dr. Pebo had started molecular cloning of skin tissue grafts from Berlin mummy and also derived these sequences. But that was not it, because soon he found out that the majority of the sequences that he derived were contaminating DNA and not the ancient sequences that he was looking for. And that kind of gave him the idea that it's not going to be an easy task because he'd be faced with many a challenge. And the first and foremost challenge was DNA damage induced by strand breaks and chemical modifications. Now, when the DNA is present within the cell, it is protected from all such chemical insults by means of a very active repair mechanism. But once the cell is dead, the repair mechanism is no longer functional and this is what precisely makes these alterations irreversible and tampers with the amount of information stored in these molecules. Apart from that, contaminating DNA from microbes that have colonized the tissue over the years and also modern day human contamination at the time of processing or handling can deter the process of sequencing. The major challenges that they faced in the shape of DNA damage included double strand breaks which kind of reduced the amount of information stored in the molecules and also DNA lesion. Now, the team sorted out these issues by carrying out PCRs of overlapping short fragments, which would lead to loss, I mean, evading the loss of information, and also multiple independent PCRs cloning sequencing, which would actually lead them to understand the differences between the lesions that were already present in the ancestral molecules and the ones that were later on misincorporated. Now, the DNA molecules often tend to form adducts with other biomolecules. Now, PTV is an agent that basically frees DNA from these traps and makes the process of sequencing easier. 
As Garvita has already mentioned about the excavations carried out in the Vindija cave in Croatia, I will not go into the details. So there were these three bone specimens, numbered 16, 25, and 26 respectively, that were found from different layers of the Vindija cave. The team wanted to find out whether this individual, the individuals were different. I mean, the bone specimens were found from different individuals or not. Mitochondrial DNA sequencing confirmed that the 25th specimen was indeed a different individual, but the other two were indistinguishable. That's when autosomal DNA sequencing came into place, and it said that, yes, the three bones belonged to three different individuals, but two of them were maternally related. Now, to understand this, we have to understand the pattern of inheritance of mitochondrial and nuclear DNA. Okay, now, for nuclear DNA, we know that both the parents confer to the genetic makeup of the progeny, whereas for mitochondrial DNA, only the mother contributes to the progeny and not the father, which makes the nuclear DNA inheritance Mendelian, whereas mitochondrial a non-Mendelian pattern of inheritance. And this somehow explains why mitochondrial DNA sequencing could not distinguish between the maternally related individuals. But be it mitochondrial sequencing or nuclear DNA sequencing, one needs to increase or enrich the amount of Neanderthal DNA in the isolated DNA pool, which already contained huge amounts of microbial DNA and present-day human DNA as contaminants. Microbial DNA contaminants were somehow dealt with sequence-specific restriction enzymes, for example, bacterial sequence-specific restriction enzyme DPN1 that we use in our daily reactions. And also, the amount of human DNA contamination was estimated with the help of two strategies. The first strategy involved determining the sex of the bones. Luckily for them, three of the bones were females. So they started looking for the frequency of occurrence of the percentage of male contamination. How? By taking reference Y chromosome segments. And for the second strategy, they were measuring the amount or frequency of occurrence of the ancestral alleles. Because more the ancestral alleles will denote an ancient genome, whereas more derived alleles will denote a present-day DNA sequence. Any DNA pool that contained more than 1.5% of Neanderthal DNA were taken up for further processing using the 454 Life Sciences GS FLX platform, which is a Pyro sequencing platform and also the Illumina Solexa GA2 platform. So the next step was, as I said, the preparation of the 454 library. Now, Fabo and his team had very interestingly called this the double-stranded sequencing method because it allows the ancient molecule to be present twice the number of times uh, in the library. Now, any information or substitution that marks the difference between the ancient DNA and the modern DNA were fed into the adapters. These adapters were biotinylated, and they helped trap thousands of double-stranded DNA molecules into streptavidin-coated beads of their own. The beads were then sent into uh, emulsion PCR, followed by amplification and subsequent pyro sequencing. Now, with these techniques in hand, Dr. Pebo and his team were able to sequence 5.3 GB of genomic data from a meager amount of 400 milligrams of bone powder. That kind of gives them the encouragement to go for whole length genome sequencing. And by 2010, they were able to achieve 55% decoding of the Neanderthal sequence. And that itself is a huge achievement. So once the sequencing was somehow sorted out, they started tracing the Neanderthal contribution in the genetic makeup of modern day humans. So as far as evolution and migration of human beings were concerned, there were two models which were in place. The first one being the replacement model. It said that the ancient ancestors of modern human, they went out of Africa and kind of erased all other archaic hominin populations which were existing in Asia and Europe. The assimilation model, on the other hand, said that the ancestor went out of Africa and there were subsequent admixtures with the other archaic hominin populations, and that kind of led to their contribution in the genetic makeup of modern day human. Dr. Pabu had started his work with mitochondrial DNA sequencing because the mitochondrial DNA is short and contains repeated sequences. And also, he started looking for persistent substitutions. 
Well, the results showed that the Neanderthals were quite divergent from the modern humans, which meant that probably the replacement model was the one that was in play. But as I had previously said, one cannot understand the genetic history of mankind based only on mitochondrial DNA because it is maternally inherited and does not give us an idea about the paternal lineage at all. So to understand how we came to become what we are, one needs to understand the gen sorry, the genetic sequence or the DNA sequence or the nuclear DNA sequence. Right, so once the nuclear DNA sequence was decoded, they started comparing it with a human reference genome and also genomes from chimps, orangutans, and rhesus monkeys. What were they looking for? They were looking for substitutions that would change the protein coding capacity of the protein, uh, I mean, of the genes, and that were also fixed for the derived alleles in case of modern human and ancestral alleles in case of ancient human. A few genes that they had mentioned included SPAG17, which is an exonymal protein that is uh, associated with sperm motility, PCD16, which is associated with wound healing, TTF1, which is a ribosomal gene transcription termination factor, CAN15, the role of which has not yet been deduced, and RPTN, which encodes for uh, extracellular epidermal matrix protein, which is present in many a tissue, including the filiform papillae of the tongue. Now, not only were there substitutions, but also changes in the position of the start and the stop codon. For example, in case of TRPM1, which encodes for melastatin, an iron channel that is responsible for melanocyte pigmentation in the skin. So we find that there were several genes affected, and these majorly contributed to the skin morphology or the physiology. Next, they went on to search for the positive selections that might have taken place in modern humans. And they were interestingly found out that there were positive selection for derived alleles in genes that were involved with energy metabolism and also with cognitive capacities of the modern day human. Another example was the RUNX2 gene, which is associated with cledocranial dysplasia. Now, this is a condition that is marked by symptoms such as frontal bossing, which means the protruded cranium long clavicle and a bell-shaped ribcage that has a larger capacity to hold the heart and the lungs. Now, these were basically the morphological markers of the Neanderthal. And the positive selection of the derived alleles for the RUNX2 gene basically led to loss of these features in modern-day human, which makes us morphologically quite different from our ancestors. Now, that's not all, because till date, interestingly, we bear Neanderthal marks in our genome. How? Let's talk about progesterone receptors. Now, progesterone is a hormone which is secreted by the corpus luteum, and it helps in the formation of the inner uterine lining at the time of fertilization and implantation. So this progesterone receptors are encoded by the PGR gene. Now, there is a particular Neanderthal variant for this PGR gene, which has a missense mutation for valine to leucine. And the frequency of occurrence of this particular variant is about 20% in the non-African population. Now, interestingly, individuals that have this variant are associated with preterm birth phenomenon, which is a risk factor. So questions arose, if it has a risk, why is it occurring at such high frequency? Well, studies showed that individuals with this particular variant experienced less bleeding at the time of uh, pregnancy, fewer miscarriages, and also increased number of offsprings. That basically means that in spite of being risky, it also was promoting fertility in modern human. And that is probably why it was preserved from the Neanderthals. Another example is cytochrome P450 gene, site 2 c 8 2 c 9 which is inherited as a in haplotype. And it also has got a Neanderthal variant. And this variant is associated with slower metabolism of drugs such as ibuprofen and warfarin, which basically increases the T half of the drug. Increasing of T half means it will lead to a lowering of the dosage because at therapeutic dosage, these drugs can be toxic. So the Neanderthal variants indeed had a positive effect on the clinical impact on human and hence probably it got fixed in course of evolution. Now, all these studies show that the Neanderthals were closer to the non-Africans and Pebo gave us four propositions to come to this conclusion. 
The first one said that this is Homo erectus, which is a common ancestor of the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals. And it said that admixtures of the Homo erectus with the Neanderthals kind of led them to have gene segments which made them quite divergent from the modern day human. The second theory said that the Neanderthals were closer to certain European populations and not others. But this was negated. Why? Because the Neanderthals were equidistant from all non-African population. This brings us to the third and most parsimonious proposition which said that the Neanderthals had admixtures with some modern humans who left Africa and that's why they became closer to the Neanderthals than the African population. But strangely no reverse gene flow from Neanderthal to modern day human was tracked. This brings us to the fourth theory, which is the most probable theory, that the older substructure of human population was preserved in Africa. Certain section of the ancestors went out of Africa. They had admixtures with the Neanderthals, and that's why the non-African populations have more Neanderthal contribution than the African populations, and that is interesting. Well, he did not only talk about the Neanderthals and their contribution, but he talked about a very unique group of hominins which were not known till date, and this were the obscured Denisovans. The remains of the Denisovans were found from the southern Siberian Denisova caves. Now, the Denisovans are quite divergent from the Neanderthals. They were, although they had a common ancestor, and interestingly, the Denisovan contribution to the western part was almost nil as compared to considerable con uh, uh, contribution to the eastern population. Thus, it means that the upper Pleistocene saw the existence of two hominin groups, the western Neanderthals and the eastern Denisovans. Now, Babu had very wittily commented that he had caught the Neanderthals and the Denisovans quite in the act during this process of research. Why did he say so? Because of the very small piece of bone which was found in the Denisova cave, it was a 13-year-old female bone and mitochondrial DNA sequencing suggested that it was a Neanderthal bone. But Pabo was not at all satisfied. He asked his team to undergo autosomal DNA sequencing and compared it with the Neanderthals, the Denisovans and the modern human reference genome. And what did he find out? That the there was 40% similarity with the Neanderthals and 40% similarity with the Denisovans. Now, this could lead to two conclusions. Either this was the first direct offspring of two ancient hominin interbreeding, or perhaps it was a progeny of a hybrid that was already existing. Further studies showed that one set of chromosomes came from the Neanderthals and one came from the Denisovans. Now, Viola, we meet Denny, the first direct offspring of a Neanderthal mom and a Denisovan dad. And wow. But that, I mean, that kind of arises another question. If the Denisovans and the Neanderthals were interbreeding at such a high frequency, then why were they so distant genetically? Well, poor Denny here, she was either un biologically unfit or infertile, and that is what led to the hominins being so distant for thousands of years. Now, summarizing Professor Pebo's work, he gave us an idea about the Neanderthal sequence. And that sequence gave us notions about the substitutions and the positive selections that were fixed in course of evolution. And he also talked about the existence of three different hominin lineage. But that's not all. He said that they were not only cohabiting, but they were also interbreeding. And that kind of led them to contribute to each other's genetic makeup. And isn't that interesting? I guess, I guess that's the most intriguing part about his research. This brings me to the Indian contribution to understanding population history because India harbors a diverse population with several endogamous groups. We have to mention Dr. late Dr. Lalji Singh who pioneered genome study in India and together with Professor S.K. Brahmachari headed the Indian Genome Variation Consortium. It initially aimed at studying the disease-causing genes and polymorphisms which were present in India, but later on also went ahead and gave us an idea about the population history and linguistic associations among the different groups of the country. Dr. David Reich, in collaboration with Dr. K. Thangaraj of CCMB Hyderabad, gave us an insight into the gradient ancestry of South Asia from the remains of the Indus Valley Civilization. 
The Genome India is a project that has been currently taken up in 2020, and it compares full sequence of human genomes uh, of about 10,000 individuals from different parts of the country that helps us form a human library. And it also studies the nature of the diseases that occur in India and uh, promises to embark on methods to improve the diagnostic markers for these diseases. If we are talking about human origins and hominin lineages, we will have to mention Dr. Parthopi Mojumdar. He has very interestingly pointed out that whatever, apart from the migration that were taking place in outside of Africa and the mixtures with the archaic hominin population, there was also another group that had exited Africa, taken the southern route, and directly landed up in the plains and islands of India. And this group had not encountered any admixture with archaic population in, on their way to where they landed. This kind of makes him call them the living relics of the out of Africa migration. And interestingly, it puts into perspective the negrito morphology and also the unclassifiable languages that are spoken by the people belonging to the Ongir and the Jarwa tribe in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands of India. And that kind of gives us an idea about the ethnicity of the Indian tribes and probable hominin lineages that have taken place in our country. Well, this brings me to the food for thought that the past is so deep that the search is never ending. Fabo had embarked on this quest for ancient DNA and asked questions. Questions like, what made us able to build such an enormous society? What made us go and spread globally? And not only that, develop technologies that we so proudly call characteristics of our civilization only. Well, in his course, he, given, uh, he have given answers as well, that we indeed carried some genetic elements from our ancestors, from the past, that has helped us curate our present, and probably understanding them better might lead to an enriched future. Thank you. Thank you, Tribeni. On that note, we realize how important understanding the past is, and that is exactly why Professor Pabo's work remains so significant. These discussions have left us extremely overwhelmed and hungry for newer ideas and discoveries. I would end quoting Alfred Nobel, if I had thousand ideas and only one turns out to be good, then I'm satisfied. As this is an intri intriguing field of uh, human evolution and uh, answers about where are we and where do we came from. And uh, now the house is open for discussion. So is there any questions from audience with respect to the session? I request both the speakers, Tribeni and Garvita to accompany on the stage. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. It was, um, I, I could, um, things which I read long back. One thing I'm wondering if I have forgotten or if I have not understood correctly, wanted to clarify, is that Denisovan gene also provided and has been characterized to provide adaptive advantage in terms of Tibetan population. I think mostly it has gone to the um, Melanesian region, right, Denisovan? So in terms of uh, physiologic advantage, um, is it just something to do with um, what, altitude or something? Is, is, are you, uh, am I missing something or I'm forgetting, I think? Um, so probably that will have to do with the colder temperatures, yes. Yeah. Uh, because uh, the Neanderthal, or in fact the Denisovan variants that uh, we still st tend to carry because about 9% of contribution is seen in our genome for the Denisovan. And uh, probably that has got to do with the climate. I mean, that's very interesting because the bell-shaped ribcage that I was talking about, mm. it kind of, uh, harp I mean, it kind of gave them the capacity to harbor uh, larger lungs. And that kind of uh, leads to more ox uh, oxygen consumption. 
acclimatization right. to high altitude i think yes that is, yes that is sir something yes without without having to produce a lot of rbc right that sir that kind of thing and, yes and another thing is it not uh, that uh, pabo also um he also uh, implicates some um, metaphase mechanism as unique to human for a cell division metaphase means the 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 particularly it, for yeah. neural stem cell uh, division mm -hmm. being quite unique to human compared to neanderthal uh, is is it is it attributed to this work no metaphase kind of thing no okay then i'm mixing with somebody else okay. so actually the uh, research that he has done is so vast like uh, we were unable to like uh, put it down in such a concise manner yeah. we have tried our best but yeah. uh, like there are this such a depth in it yeah, like I, I, I this point read uh, long back and forth. actually the book uh, i read so i'm sorry yes sir it yeah, is it yeah, is right yes yeah. sir. okay i mean i would take this to uh, say that he even pointed out that um, if we are carrying certain neanderthal alleles that we are and for certain genes then we are actually about 8.5 years older in terms of pain so he actually came to say this that maybe the neanderthals looked like they were stronger than us but they were basically not they were very sensitive to pain and carrying their alleles in our genome makes us sensitive to pain about 8.5 years older i mean that's huge Thank you, everyone. Now, I would like to invite on stage Director Ma'am to address the gathering and give her concluding remarks. Ma'am, please. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone, actually. Um, who didn't realize time flying um, as we listen to these uh, talented students present their present the stories of two uh, four Nobel laureates um, with such clarity, with such depth, and um, with with the uh, with 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 the, the power of a storyteller. You know, as I was listening to them, I was reminded of a children's story. I'd read many years ago uh, by this uh, Italian-American writer, Leo Leone, and it's the story of a group of field mice. And there's one field mouse in that story called Frederick. And these field mice, they're very busy through the, through the, through the autumn uh, time period, collecting nuts and acorns and storing them for the bitter winter that's to follow, all except Frederick. Frederick kind of sat in the sun and looked at, you know, looked at nature, looked around him and uh, seemed very dreamy. And all the field mice said, you know, what's wrong with you, Frederick? Why aren't you helping us collect nuts? And he said, I'm collecting stories. And, you know, because they were a very good group of field mice, they just tolerated him and said, all right, we'll just live with this. And then the winter came and the field mice started to, you know, eat through their collection. And then the collections became very meager. And then the collections were all over and there was no more food left. And the field mice were getting very restless and they were, they were unhappy. And then they, they turned to Frederick and they said, well, well, Frederick, what about your collection? And he said, right, all of you sit down around me. And then he started to tell his stories and his stories were about the world, about, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars and, you know, all kinds of things that he had dreamed up while the other field mice were collecting nuts. So for the last two plus hours, our student speakers helped us forget the cold, took us to a different place told the stories of these Nobel Prize winners with such clarity and such beauty that I'm really, really spellbound. I'm sure all of you are. A big round of applause for all of them.
and not to not to forget the two anchors uh, who also uh, helped us put everything together. Uh, the the presentations were 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 marvelous, and I know a lot of hard work went into it. And I compliment the students, all of them, on on uh, uh, taking the time to do this. It took them out of their research. I know some of their faculty supervisors were probably wondering when they'll come back to, you know, doing more research. But <laughs> it was well worth it. And I think this particular exercise of learning to tell a story will hold them uh, in good stead in the future, as well as prepare them for um, many more stories in science that they'll have to tell. So I, um, I, I congratulate all of the students. I also want to mention that the mentors have done a fantastic job. This would not have been possible without the dedication and hard work of our three mentors. Uh, and uh, they're all here. Um, Saman, Kinshuk, and uh, Ravindra. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for your dedication and your commitment to teaching. This, uh, this exercise would have taken a lot of effort and time from your side, and, I, and all of us acknowledge that. Thank you. So uh, we'll we'll end the session today with um, re with a recognition, a small token from from the institution side to the to the speakers. Um, are you here? Yeah. Okay. So you want to announce the speakers? Yeah. I request all the mentors to join the stage. For... First, I would like to request Ms. Sang Priya Singh to receive the token. Thank you, Mr. Jajan Lal. Thank you. Ms. Priyanka Pandey. Thank you. Ms. Garvita Mishra. Thank you, Ms. Tribeni Chatterjee. Let's have a formal photo session. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Now we'll proceed for the vote of thanks. Mr. Prajwal, please. It is not possible to thank everyone for such an appreciating involvement and willingness to complete the, this event. But this is a only mean to convey a warm gratitude on behalf of our team to you all. We are very thankful to our director ma'am who provided the platform to organize this event and supporting us throughout. 
we want to extend our sincere gratitude to all the three mentors of this year's Nobel Symposium, Dr. Saman Habib, Dr. Ravind Kumar, and Dr. Kinshuk Raj Shravastav, for their guidance and encouragement. Without them, this symposium would not have been possible to conduct so efficiently. We would also like to extend our thanks to our supervisors, Dr. Dr. Saman Habib, Dr. Atul Goel, Dr. Rajesh Kumar Jha, Dr. Rajay Kumar Srivastav, Dr. Damodar Reddy, and Dr. Vidyut Purkhet for their continuous support. We take this opportunity to thank our technical team and personals for conducting this event flawlessly and to everyone who contributed either directly or indirectly in any capacity for making this symposium successful. Thanks to all the participants. And last but not least, we are grateful to all the audience for your gracious presence today. Thank you all. And now I would like to ask you to please stand up for our national anthem. Janakana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab Sindh Gujarat Maratha Dravida Uttkala Vanga Vindya Himachal Yamuna Kanga Uchana Chalakita Ranga Dava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gare Tava Jaya Gata Jana Gana Mandana Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vithata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He